horror, thriller, and slasher movies are often terrifying in their own right. So what happens when these genres of film decide to tackle real life cases? Hollywood is bursting with films based on real life events, and if done with respect and integrity, they can add a whole new dimension to the movie watching experience. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two shocking cases of crimes that inspired movies. But first, we'd like to thank Word Farm Adventure for sponsoring today's episode. If you're like us here at Cold Case Detective, you're probably a true crime junkie, spending a good amount of time diving deep into the darker realms of history, culture, and human nature. However, it's also important to find reprieve from the glum and the gloomy, find ways to escape the murderous moods of true crime, and find solace in worlds of relaxation, easygoing puzzles, colorful vistas, and creative spaces. Well, you can find just that with today's sponsor, Word Farm Adventure, which is available now on Android and iOS, and you can download for free following the link in the description of this video. Word Farm Adventure is the next major mobile game, the first to combine crossword puzzles and word scramble puzzles with scape adventures and design, transforming into a platform for any means of escape and entertainment, all from the comfort of your phone. It truly is a unique game, holding hundreds of levels that increase in difficulty, making it a rewarding experience and always leaving you with new content. Take your designing talents to places like the farm or the county fair, unlocking new tools and techniques with every puzzle you solve. One of Word Farm Adventure's iconic locations waiting to be restored is the villa. At the villa, you'll have opportunities to update the landscaping, tear down the old exterior, and renovate all of its luxurious rooms. As you win more of the levels, the faster you return the villa to its former prestige, such as growing pink flowers for the perfect accent color, and painting the walls yellow to make the place truly shine. It doesn't just scratch your itch for all things design, but challenges your brain as well. Here's our version of the completed villa. So give yourself that much needed break and download Word Farm Adventure now from the link in the video description, available for free on Android and iOS. And now let's dive in with today's episode. The Snowtown Murders. In 2011, director Justin Kurzel released the film Snowtown as his directorial debut. Premiering at the Adelaide Film Festival, the movie was praised by critics at the time and has generally received favorable reviews since. Based on the infamous Snowtown Murders, which occurred in Australia in the 1990s, the film is said to be a difficult watch as Kurzel did not sugarcoat nor glamorize the cold-blooded and brutal nature of these real-life crimes. The Snowtown Murders, which are also known as the Bodies in Barrels Murders, occurred between August of 1992 and May of 1999 in and around Adelaide in South Australia. The first body was found in the township of Lower Light in 1994 but no connection was made to the killers, and the crime was thought to be an isolated incident, rather than something which was attached to a whole slew of serial slayings. A later death carried out by the same group of people in 1997 was thought to have been a suicide. The police only began putting the pieces together when a man called them on November 20th of 1998 to report his sister missing. Elizabeth Hayden was last seen the day before, but hadn't been seen or heard from since, and this was uncharacteristic of her. Upon investigating further, authorities were surprised to find that Elizabeth had a husband, Mark, who had not reported her missing. When they spoke with Hayden, he gave them conflicting accounts of his wife's whereabouts, and various different reasons as to why he had not reported her missing. 
Law enforcement's inquiries into the disappearance of Elizabeth Hayden led them to an old state bank building, which was being rented by her husband, located in the small town of Snowtown, about 87 miles north of Adelaide. On May 20th of 1999, inside a disused vault, South Australian police found six plastic barrels with the remains of eight people, including Elizabeth Hayden. From here, the horrific case unraveled before their very eyes. John Justin Bunting, born September 4th of 1966, was described as the leader of the serial killer group. As a child, Bunting was physically and sexually abused by a friend's older brother. As he grew older, he began to develop a passionate hatred for all kinds of people, in particular, members of the LGBTQ community, although specifically, he despised gay men, drug users, and anyone else he considered to be quote-unquote weak or a nuisance to society. Described as a man with a god complex, Bunting had a spider wall, which was a web of coloured wool on which he stuck notes with the names of those he was targeting next. At the age of 22, Bunting began working at an abattoir. He reportedly bragged about slaughtering animals, and claimed it was what he enjoyed most in life. Other sources have noted that he had a fascination with harming animals, long before he started on this career path. In 1991, Bunting moved to a house in Salisbury North, in the southern part of the country. He began dating and living with a woman named Christine Harvey, and her teenage son, James. James eventually began participating in Bunting's crimes. Additionally, Bunting made friends with two of his neighbors, Robert Wagner and Mark Hayden. Robert Joe Wagner, who was born in Parramatta, New South Wales, on November 28th of 1971, was reportedly encouraged to participate in the killings by Bunting. When the pair first met, Wagner was dating someone considerably older than himself. There is some confusion about his partner's identity. Most say that Wagner was dating Barry Lane, a cross-dresser and member of the gay community. However, a few others have noted that Lane went by the name Vanessa and was a transgender woman. It is unclear which version is correct. Most notably, Wagner began dating Lane when he was just a child, at 14 years old, while Lane was a fully-fledged adult in their late 20s. Mark Hayden, born on December 4th of 1958, was an associate of Bunting's. In January of 1999, he began renting the abandoned state bank in Snowtown, suggesting to the authorities that the bodies had been placed elsewhere, but had been moved when the investigation into Elizabeth's disappearance began. With the rental being in Hayden's name, this was perhaps not their cleverest move, but it is a relief, as this is what put an end to the group's heinous crimes. While Bunting was believed to have spearheaded the group's activities, all four men were thought to have participated in the murders at one point or another. On May 21st of 1999, following the discovery of the bodies in the barrels, the foursome were arrested. Two more bodies were found buried in Bunting's back garden, and in total, they were thought to be responsible for the murders of 12 people. Their victims include Wagner's partner, Lane, and Hayden's wife, as well as both the stepbrother and half-brother of James. The trial of both Bunting and Wagner lasted almost 12 months, the longest in the history of South Australia. In December of 2003, Bunting was convicted of 11 murders. Wagner was convicted of 10, and had previously confessed to three. Meanwhile, the young James pled guilty to four. In 2004, Hayden was convicted on five counts of assisting with the murders and admitted to two of those. The final charge against Bunting and Wagner was dropped because the jury were unable to reach a verdict. The pair had been accused of murdering Bunting's ex-girlfriend, Suzanne Allen. As the ringleader, Bunting was sentenced to 11 consecutive terms of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Wagner was sentenced to 10 consecutive terms of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He stated from the dock, quote, Pedophiles were doing terrible things to children. The authorities didn't do anything about it. I decided to take action. I took that action. 
thank you. He claimed this, despite the fact that the vast majority of the group's victims were not pedophiles. Many were either intellectually disabled or members of the LGBTQ community. James was sentenced to four consecutive terms of life imprisonment, with a non-parole period of 26 years. He is currently living in isolation in an unidentified South Australian prison. In 2001, he confessed to four of the murders, which led to him becoming a key witness for the Crown prosecution. As for Mark Hayden, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison, with a non-parole period of 18 years. The true motive for the killings has never been established, although one article about the crimes by Australian newspaper The Age notes that the primary motive was an ego fueled mix of power and pleasure. It has also been determined that the crimes escalated over time. The group's first victim was a 22-year-old gay man named Clinton Trezise, who was reportedly bashed over the head with a blunt instrument on August 31st of 1992 by bunting. However, things did escalate after that point, with many of the victims being tortured before their deaths. When the men were arrested, they were found to be in possession of knives, saws, at least one shotgun, rope, tape, gloves, pliers, clamps, a cloth, and a tool which administered electric shocks. Details of what these victims went through are available online, but please be warned, if you choose to explore further, it is graphic stuff. Although not thought to be the main motive behind the group's actions, before killing their victims, the men often had them recite their bank information so they could access their accounts after death. In other cases, the group continued collecting the victims' money because they were never reported missing. Over the course of their crimes, they gathered nearly $100,000 from their victims. James was just 20 when he helped kill 24-year-old David Johnson in May of 1999. He was the group's last victim, and as well as being tortured, he was made to hand over all his financial information so his accounts could be accessed and his money stolen after his murder. The notoriety of the murders brought Snowtown an economic boost from tourists who flocked to see the town where the gruesome crimes played out. But the boost was short-lived, and Snowtown was left with a lasting stigma. Town officials considered changing Snowtown's name to Rosetown to rid themselves of the association with the murders. But as of 2021, the name remains unchanged. Christine and Walter Collins. In 2008, Clint Eastwood directed the mystery crime drama Changeling, in which Angelina Jolie portrays Christine Collins, a woman whose son goes missing in the spring of 1928. Months after his vanishing, the pair are reunited, but Christine quickly realizes that this little boy is not her son, and dedicates the remainder of her life searching for answers. An emotional and intense tale, Changeling is based on the story of a real-life woman of the same name. Christine June was born on December 14th of 1888. Although little is recorded about her early life, she met and married a man named Walter J. Collins at some point as a young adult. Unbeknownst to Christine at the time, Walter was an ex-convict who had served time for robbery and who was using a fake name. He was born Walter Joseph Anson and hid his past from her, although he ended up serving further time in prison after their marriage. In September of 1918, Christine gave birth to the couple's only child, a son, who they also named Walter. On March 10th of 1928, Christine, who was now a single mother following her husband's incarceration and was living in LA, California, gave her nine-year-old son some money so that he could visit the cinema. However, Walter never returned home that night. Terrified for the safety of her only child, Christine immediately alerted law enforcement to her son's uncharacteristic disappearance and subsequently, the case received nationwide attention. During the course of the investigation, detectives followed up on hundreds of leads, many of which were deemed to be hoaxes. Sightings of Walter poured in from up and down the country. A gas station attendant in Glendale believed that he saw the little boy wrapped in newspapers from the neck down in the back of a car. 
Witnesses claim to have seen Walter in Oakland and San Francisco, while a neighbor told police that she had seen him in a vehicle with two foreign-looking people begging to be let go. Other locals stated that they had been approached by an Italian-looking couple who were asking around for Walter's address. However, as the months passed by, the nine-year-old's location eluded both authorities and his loved ones. The LAPD began to feel the weight of the missing child on their shoulders and were receiving pressure from their higher-ups to close the case, while the media reported negatively about the lack of progress being made in the disappearance. Their only theory was that Walter had been taken in retaliation for something his father had done, although they never managed to pin down any suspects or expand on this idea. But then, miraculously, five months after Walter vanished, the police came to Christine with some good news. Her little boy had been found. Shocked and overjoyed by this news, Christine listened as police informed her that Walter had been taken to the city of DeKalb, Illinois, where he managed to somehow flee and turn himself into police. Numerous letters and photos were exchanged between Christine and her son before she finally paid for Walter to be brought home to LA. At their reunion, however, Christine noticed that something was off. Although the boy looked similar, he was not Walter, and he failed to know some of the details of his life that she would expect her son to know, such as the name of his father, Captain J.J. Jones, who was leading the investigation, claimed that the child simply looked different due to the passage of time and the trauma he had endured from being kidnapped. The Los Angeles Times reported, not only was the youth's body sadly emaciated and his face drawn, but his mind had been affected, according to officers who examined him. Apparently the result, they said, of harrowing experiences he had been subjected to by his kidnapper. Despite this, Christine remained steadfast in her belief that this little boy was not hers. Captain Jones convinced the 40-year-old mother of one to try the boy out by taking him home with her. Exhausted by the pressure she felt from the officer, Christine obliged. But after three weeks, she had not changed her mind. Armed with dental records, which proved the two boys weren't the same, as well as the word of a handwriting expert who'd analyzed and compared the boy's handwriting to Walter's, Christine confronted the LAPD about her son. Embarrassed by the accusations and still feeling forced into closing the case, Jones lashed out at Christine and alleged that she was a bad mother whose only aim was to bring ridicule to the force. Subsequently, Jones had the distraught mother committed to a psychiatric ward at LA County Hospital under a Code 12 internment, a term that was used to jail or commit someone who was deemed to be either difficult or an inconvenience. During the time in which Christine was committed, Jones questioned the young boy further. The child eventually revealed that he was not Walter Collins. He was 12-year-old Arthur Hutchins Jr., a runaway and juvenile criminal from Iowa. Arthur had a difficult relationship with his stepmother, who didn't want or love him, and shortly before pretending to be the missing nine-year-old, he had been arrested for stealing and was meant to check in with the police on a regular basis. After being picked up by law enforcement in Illinois, he had been asked if he was Walter Collins. At first he said no, but then he said yes, and he wanted to start over in Hollywood and escape his family. After 10 days, Christine was released from the mental hospital. Understandably furious about how she'd been treated and devastated that she still had no answers as to the whereabouts or fate of her missing son, she took the LAPD to task, filing a lawsuit against them. She specifically targeted Jones and won the lawsuit. She was awarded the modern day equivalent of $155,000 but Jones never paid her the money she was due. Additionally, Jones was suspended from the police force for several months, but was later permanently reinstated. Meanwhile, police investigated a tip from a young woman in Canada who claimed that her brother was being abused by their uncle who ran a poultry farm in the town of Wineville, California. Following the investigation in 1929, a man named Gordon Stewart Northcott, the tipster's uncle, was found guilty of abducting, molesting, and killing three young boys, 
in what was dubbed the Wineville Chicken Coop Murders. Sanford Clark was Northcott's nephew and the tipster's brother, and he had been abused both physically and sexually while staying with his uncle. He had pointed out the makeshift graves to authorities, which lay under the farm's chicken coop. The shallow graves had been filled with quicklime, and shreds of a bloody mattress had accompanied the burial spots, as well as numerous body parts. From Clark's testimony, police discovered that Northcott's mother, Sarah Louise, had helped him kill the boys and dispose of their bodies. Clark had also helped, but only because he had been threatened with violence if he did not comply. He added that he was terrified of his uncle. When Sarah Northcott was questioned, she admitted that late in 1928, she had participated in the murder of nine-year-old Walter Collins. As a result of her confession, she was sentenced to life in prison without trial for Walter's murder. While the state chose to not prosecute her son for Walter's demise, they brought him to trial for the three remaining murders. There was forensic evidence for these victims, while no trace of Walter's clothing or body was found at the farm. It is unclear how many sets of remains were discovered in the graves, and it is believed by the authorities that Walter became a victim of Northcott and his mother, but it does not appear that his clothing or remains were found with the others. On February 13th of 1929, Gordon Northcott was found guilty of all three murders and sentenced to death. He denied being involved with the disappearance of Walter, and his mother later tried to retract her confession. She reportedly gave many other scattered and inconsistent statements to the authorities. Gordon was much the same. While he initially confessed to killing five boys, he then said he'd only killed one, but later told a prison guard that he'd taken the lives of as many as 20 children. Christine Collins chose to believe that Sarah Northcott had given a false confession, despite the fact that Sanford Clark had corroborated her story about her part in Walter's murder. Christine exchanged letters with Gordon while he awaited his execution, and eventually received permission to interview him shortly before he was put to death. Northcott promised the mother of one that he would explain what really happened to Walter, but changed his mind at the last minute, telling her, I don't want to see you. I don't know anything about it. I'm innocent. Gordon Northcott was executed on October 2nd of 1930. Five years later, a boy and his parents came forward, claiming that in 1928, the boy had disappeared. His parents had filed a report with the police, and at the time, law enforcement officers had suspected that he was another victim of the Northcotts. The police had never been told by the Northcotts or Sanford Clark that a boy had escaped. This discovery reignited hope for Christine Collins, who hoped that her son too had managed to flee before he was killed. Walter's father died in 1932. Christine continued to search for her missing child for the rest of her life. On numerous occasions, she attempted to get the money which was owed to her by Captain Jones, and even took him to court for a second time in 1941, but she was never paid. Christine died in 1964, aged 75, and was buried in Los Angeles. The whereabouts of Walter Collins are still unknown. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.